Morning, morning, how are you? I asked Peter last week if I could share with you guys um, my story. Some of you know it already, but I had just reviewed it last week and I was very excited. And during the week, I almost talked myself out of doing this because I get nervous. And Peter said over the phone, don't think about it. So I'm trying to do that. Um, I have my little notes here. So in late April, I had a mammogram. It was suspicious. They called me and said they wanted me to come back for a second mammogram. Dang, it's bright up here. And um, <clears throat> I was getting ready to go on our vacation for three weeks. So we set it up in early June, right when we got back, two days after we got back. When I got back, had the second mammogram. The doctor said she was very suspicious because the cells that she was seeing were in a row, which means they were probably in a duct, and that could be cancerous. So they set me up for a biopsy. I had the biopsy, I believe it was July 2nd. All this was going very fast. And the biopsy came back positive for ductal carcinoma, and it was stage zero. Have you ever heard of stage zero? I never had. And they said, we can go in, take it out surgically. And at first, when this came up, I was kind of ticked. Like, OK, two weeks ago, I just got an OK for bladder cancer being all done. I was all clear, didn't have to go back for another year for a checkup. And I thought, oh, I don't have to go to the doctor now all year. What a relief, you know. Um, and as time went on, I was less angry. Not, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't fearful. I felt that everything was going to be OK. But it was an annoyance and an irritation to me. But as time went on, and I went through things and all the blessings that happened, I was repenting of my anger, and I was thanking God for all his blessings. So um, first of all, I've had a lot of surgeries in my life, starting at five months old. I had surgery for pyloric stenosis, then I had clogged tear duct, then I had a cyst on my ovaries the size of a tomato, then I had a tumor in my chest, and that Chemotherapy from that damaged my heart. Then I had a defibrillator implanted. Then I had bladder cancer and all kinds of biopsies, blah, 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 blah. And so that's why I was ready to be done with everything. Frequent flyer miles, Peter, you talk about that, right? <laughs> so um, as everything started, the first day when we went for the surgery, Wayney, <laughs> I don't know if you guys believe in visuals like Jesus talked through parables and everything. I, he just speaks to me in visual things. We were driving away from the house, and these are our two yuccas that are in bloom, and all I could see was this V for victory. And I said, Wayne, look, God's saying we're going to have victory. And when I got the bladder cancer, he gave me a snowflake in my hair when we got out. And we both said, that's from God. He's shown us he's with us. So this is our V for victory. Went in for the surgery. The surgery went really smoothly. The staff was really great. Um, I felt it was an opportunity to show them love and appreciation and be kind to them, give them a good patient, you know, so they don't have to put up with someone cranky. And it all went perfect. When I came out, went home, I never had any pain. They gave me hydrocodone. They told me to take Tylenol and the Proxen. I never took anything. I had no pain. And the third day, I was just a little sore. After that, the night that I got home, um, all of a sudden, the Lord brought to my mind this song, I'm going to see a victory. So I asked Alexa to play that song, and it fits so perfect. It was just perfect. I'll take what... the enemy meant for evil, and I'll turn it to good, I'll fight your battle, everything. And through all this, then Peter praying, I didn't tell very many people because everybody's just going to go, oh, here she goes again, now what has she got? And there's so many other things going on that people are going through that are so much worse. But 
I didn't realize Wayne had told Peter. I had told a few close friends and family. And when Peter prayed for me, I wasn't here because I was late that morning. It was potluck and I was making my salad. <laughs> so after service, everybody started coming up to me and asking me about the cancer. And I was just like, how did you know? How did you know? And I don't know what it was this time because you guys have prayed for me before. But this time, I felt so much love that week. I just... People were calling me and emailing me, and my friends and family were there. Laura was there. <laughs> Laura supported me in prayer. My prayer team supported me in prayer. Laura supported me in more ways than that, actually. Um, uh, what, I can't think of the word. Physically, she gave me some of her old undergarments from when she had cancer, so she really supported me. <laughs> um, so the whole thing just ended up being quite a blessing. And I just wanted to thank you guys for your prayers. I wanted to encourage you and let you know that our prayers are answered. I know other people are going through worse trials, but God gets us through them. He's gotten me through so many all my life. And I just want him to be glorified. I don't take any of the glory. It's all him. And to praise him. Um, and let me look at my notes real quick to make sure I didn't forget anything. Wayne, my husband, he just is such a good care caretaker and took care of me the whole way. My girlfriend, this is interesting, we went on a trip to my sister's before the biopsy right when we got back and I got the diagnosis. And she gave me this book, not knowing that God was going to show me the yuccas and all that. When faith becomes sight, opening your eyes in God's presence all around you. And so, you know, he's in all day long. Everything we see when you talk about where he's placed us, the benediction, everything we do and see all day, everything, God's in it. So I think that's all I've got. We're already at church. We could go home now, couldn't we? Don't worry. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. Wonderful. I don't need two mics at the same time. Well, we started a series last week. You have the titles of the messages in your bulletin for this week. And the series title was Restoring Weary Souls. And today I want to talk to you about building better boundaries. We spoke about soul fatigue last week, and I had a number of people come to me after the service and tell me that that is exactly where they're at, and so I just thank God for that. I'm going to talk about two words today, because they are the primary words we use to set boundaries in our lives. They are the words that commit us to something, whether we say yes or we say no. I'm in or I'm out. And they're largely the words that define us. We have problems with these words, and I'd like you to consider if there's some area where you're saying yes to God, and where you're saying yes, and God wants you to say no. These words are important, but we can be very casual about saying them. We often live uh, in whatever the pressure of the moment is, even though the pressure doesn't lead in us in the direction of our beliefs and values. Somebody asks, would you do this? Would you attend this? Would you lead this? Would you pay for this? Would you commit to this? Or somebody might say, would you, would you go on a blind date with my second cousin this Friday when he comes out of prison? You know, and so, yeah, although you had a clear no in your heart, much to your surprise, you said yes. And that jumps up in your throat and out of your mouth even before you thought about it. Jesus says correct use of, this word, of these words is vital to human life. Jesus said that in our conversations, let your yes be yes and your no, no. But we live in such a frenzied world and think we have no choice in our lives. If my life is exhausting or out of control, it's because of my work my parents, my family, my friends, my financial pressures, all the season of life, 
and there's nothing much I can do about it. That's what people think. But you know, there is a law of individual responsibility. That's what it's called in the Bible. If your way of life is damaging your heart and soul and mind and will and emotions, no one else can fix it but you. You have enormous power. The law of responsibility is the power of yes and no. Jesus uh, knew when to say yes, and you also went to say no. He said yes to becoming a human being like one of us. He said yes to the ministry of teaching and healing. He said yes to the washing of the feet, demonstrating a servant attitude. He said yes to touching a leper. He said yes to compassion and entering into someone else's suffering with them. And at the climax of his life, when he was in the garden, and God was calling him to the cross, he said, Father, even although I don't want to do this, even although I wish this cup would pass from me, not my will, but your will be done. He said yes to the Father. It also means that he said no to many other things. He said no to temptation. When the evil one came and said, just turn these stones into bread, or when the evil one came and said, just fall down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And Jesus said, no, no. And I don't even have to think about it. When a good, good friends came with some misguided request, they said, Jesus, let one of us sit on your right hand and let the other one sit on your right, left hand throughout all of eternity so that we can be the two most important persons in heaven. And Jesus said, no, even although you're my friends, you ask amiss. One time he fed 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes, and the people thought, well, maybe if he could turn five loaves and fishes into whatever he did to feed all those people, maybe if we, we get him a chariot and a, and a sword, he could create an army and overthrow the Romans. I know, I know I'm just plagiarizing, or I'm just ad-libbing a little bit. But they did say to him, let, let us make him our king. He didn't say, maybe... Let me think about it, and I'll get back to you. He didn't say, you know, these people continue to pester me. I get so tired of their whining. Okay, I'll be their king just to get them off my back. But he lived with great freedom, and he lived with great purpose, and we should live that way. In other words, walk through life with a clear understanding of who God made you to be. And let your yes be yes and your no be no. You need to say yes to what God wants you to do. You need to say no to any time you know in your spirit, in your heart, in your conscience that you're compromising yourself. Let me explain the concept of boundaries as we know it. A boundary is a personal property line that marks me off as an individual. Your homes, your fences are your personal property there. That's what you own there. Well, God wants to set boundaries around you because He is your Lord. This means I understand a deep biblical truth. This means my one and only life. Uh, and one day I will give an account of my life because God made me. You see, none of you are here by accident. None of you are here on earth by accident. God has a purpose and a destiny for each one of you. One of, the Bible, one of the biblical writers says, For it's appointed to every human being once to die and then the judgment. There's going to come a day when you and I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for our lives. Yes, we'll be saved. But yes, we're going to give an account of our lives. But if you go through life trying to please all the people in your life, you're going to be exhausted and you will miss what God intended for you. You don't have a clear sense of who God made you to be and what He's called you to do with the boundaries around your life, you'll end up overcommitted, exhausted, self-absorbed, resentful, and guilty. We need to know who God made us to be and what He's called us to do. If you don't know that yet, then you need to begin to seek His face and say, God, I'm not here by accident. There's a purpose in me being here on this earth at this point in time. So boundaries are what God made me and what God has called me to do. In general, people have two kinds of boundary problems, and I want to just quickly 
take a look at that with you. Number one, we can divide the world, and yes, there are some gray areas that we can share on either side, but we can divide the world into two kinds of people, those who are compliant and those who are controlling. And so I want to describe them, and your wives, don't start elbowing your husband now. <laughs> I want to describe these and ask you to do a little self-diagnosis. Do I tend to be compliant or am I a controller? Compli compliance have a hard time saying no. No doesn't come very easily for compliance because of fuzzy boundaries. They have a choice and they say yes even although they want to say no. They commit to tasks or projects or relationships that they don't want to. They generally seek to avoid conflict. They prefer peace, and so they say yes in the circumstance or no in that circumstance. They don't want to hurt anyone else's feelings, and they don't want someone else not to like them. So often their lives are motivated by fear. If I say no, someone might not like me, or someone might get angry. Compliance have a highly developed sense of guilt. And they often blame themselves, even if it's not their fault. A little secret about compliance is that they, do, that, they do not, that they do not want you to know, compliance are not nice many times. They appear uh, because in, they're not as nice as they appear on the outside, because inside there's a resentment factor, a dynamic, and often they are seething because they're doing something that is not in God's will, they're doing something that they don't want to do. Now, the other category is the controllers. Some of you are not compliant types, you're controllers. And as I said, there's shades on either side of these two definitions. It's not just cut and dried. If a compliant has trouble saying no, the, contro the controller has trouble hearing the word no. They may not say, they may not say no quite easily. They have difficulty saying yes. When someone says no to a controller, the controller hears maybe. When someone says maybe, the controller hears yes. The controller takes no as a personal challenge to overcome, and controllers can come in very different flavors. Some are aggressive controllers who will steamroll over folks, not taking no for an answer ever. Some people are manip manipulative controllers who want to be in control, but they are sneakier about it. They will use indirect methods such as guilt, making you feel obliged, and trying to finesse you. You find yourself being controlled, and you don't even know it until you wake up the next morning and say, oh my heavens, what have I done? Both aggressive and manipulatives have difficulty accepting uh, limits. They may know their boundaries clearly, but they don't respect anyone else's boundaries. And some of you are in, those ca in that category. He has an interesting question. What happens when a peace-loving compliant meets an insensitive controller? They get married. <laughs> and at first, it works out rather well. The compliant person is like this wonderful toy for the controlling person. Eventually, the compliant person begins to resent it. And when the compliant says, well, all right, if you insist, well, for the controller, that's definitely not a no. And so they'll just steam in. But when a controller hears yes, if I insist, well, of course I insist. That's what he hears. He doesn't hear if I insist, or if you insist, he hears yes to that particular question. The compliant doesn't mind if the, sorry, the controller doesn't mind if the compliant stews. The controller controls more than he wants to be well thought of. He doesn't care what people think about him most times. He doesn't care about that. The compliant wants to be thought of more than he wants to control. And you can use Many small diagnoses to determine who is more compliant and who is more controlling in your relationship. Whatever side you fall on, the compliant side or the controlling side, 
you can damage your own heart, harm people, miss out what God's will for your life, and your relationship can be permanently destroyed over a period of time. If you go through life exhausted because of the demands of others, you need to examine your own life and say, well, why am I like this? Why do I feel like I do? And you have this, maybe the resentment building up in you. What is the reason for that? You see, oftentimes we look in the mirror and we don't see who we really are. Or if we see somebody in that mirror and we see who we really are, we may be not strong enough to say, I need to change my life. You see, you can just go through life exhausted because of the demands of others. Knowing who God made you to be and what God's called you to do is crucial to gaining a clear sense of boundaries. <clears throat> now I want to explain, and I want to explore four key areas where clear boundaries need to be. Number one, friendship. We all want healthy, life-giving, God-honoring friendships. Most of us, at least once in our lives, have been in a relationship where you find yourself to be the only one always giving. You make the phone calls. You invest the energy to ensure you get together. And maybe you're in a relationship with a needy person. And when you, when you hear, I need, I need, give me, give me, you shudder a little bit because you know that dynamic. It's a black hole. No matter how much emotion and energy you give, it'll never be enough and you'll feel torn by guilt and anger. All relationships involve limits because you are a finite, limited person. Love involves limits. and Very often, the Bible reflects that. A classic example is the Good Samaritan. Here is love expressed, love given, but there were limits to it. As we know the story, a man was beaten and left by the roadside and two religious types came walking past, but their boundaries were so rigid that they continued walking on. They had a boundary problem. They say no when they ought to have said yes. And then a Samaritan comes along, the last guy in the world you'd expect to help, and he's moved with compassion, his heart is open, he stops, bandages the guy up, takes him to an inn, and says to the innkeeper next, the next day, I have to leave for some business, but take care of this man, and I will reimburse you for the expenses incurred. Jesus commends that. But is it interesting how the story doesn't go? Jesus didn't say, and at the right moment when the Samaritan was going to leave, the injured man wakes up, and says to the Samaritan, What? You're leaving. I'm broken and hurt and bloodied. And you worried about making money for your business? Isn't that a little selfish? What happened? Whatever happens, and why are you denying what has really happened to me? What kind of Samaritan are you? Then the Samaritan is overwhelmed with guilt. I'm sorry. I guess you're right. I could do more. Take my wallet. I'll stay home, and I'm sorry I was so selfish. In Jesus' story, the Samaritan helps, but helping has its limits. Let me say that again. Helping has its limits. Do you have somebody in your life that is constantly on the take, just taking from you all you can give, and then when you say, well, there's a limit to this, then they... They put a guilt trip on you. He bandaged the man up. The Samaritan, what he did, he bandaged the man up, but he did not perform surgery. He takes him to an inn, but he doesn't have the guy moving into his house. He pays for a few days' expenses. He doesn't give him a blank check. He's the good Samaritan, not the great Samaritan. Some of you are in a relationship where limits must be set. Maybe... You're the one that always initiates being together. Maybe you've been afraid because the truth will come out and the person is not as committed to you, as committed to you as you are to them. If this is the dynamic, 
You don't want to talk about it. You know it's there. It's kind of like the pink elephant in the room. You know it's there, but you do not want to talk about it because you know where it's going to go. Maybe that person will reject you. Maybe that person will say, you know what? You've never really been my friend. And then what do you do with that? Maybe you're in a relationship and every time you're together, your focus has always been on that person's needs and that person's problems or that person's agenda. Some of you have a person in your life and you need to be real frank with them and talk about the dynamic of your relationship. Now, how you do that, especially if you're a compliant person, well, that's going to take a bunch of courage, isn't it? Some of you need to take a relational risk. Friendships are crucially dependent on people's appropriate, healthy understanding of, bo of boundaries and their ability when to say no and when to say yes. The second area I want to cover quickly is families. It's in the families you hear and you learn about boundaries. Sometimes around the age of two, a child will learn one of these two words and it will become their favorite word. Does anyone want to guess what that is? No. Drink your milk? No. Go to bed? No. Eat your vegetables? No. And on and on. Child will grow to love and say that word with great joy. Parents often don't like that phrase, but learning to say no is very, a very important exercise for the development of every human being. No is maybe the most important boundary word, a boundary word that you want your kids to be able to say. When my daughter was about just over one years old, I put her through a routine to boost her vocabulary. I would ask her a series of questions, and she would respond with just one word. So I would say, honey, what does the cow say? Moo. Honey, what does a dog say? Woof. Honey, what does a girl say on a date? No. <laughs> I taught her to say that with great vehemence. Some have had this kind of experience. And growing up, you are loved if you were compliant. You are loved when you said yes, but love was withdrawn if you said no. Person got angry, and so you learned almost never to say no because that person, that adult's feelings, that person's demonstration of who they are to you was based upon whether you said yes or whether you said no. And so what happens is we grow up in that kind of environment. And we walk through life as an adult the way you did as a child, looking at the important people for signs of approval. And how many of us don't do that? We have people in our circle of influence that we want to be approved of. Keep walking down that road and eventually you lose clarity in what you feel and what you value. Some of you need to start taking baby steps and learning to say no. Someone asks you to do a favor and you don't have the time to do it, you won't and you won't be able to do it well. It would mean saying no to your children, maybe, to another adult, even here in the church. If we ask you to do something and it's just not within your frame of reference now, if it's just not where you're at, you're just busy already, you need to be able to have permission to say no. That doesn't change my relationship with you if you say no. It shouldn't, because then what kind of relationship did we have? But you need to start strengthening that no muscle. Children need to learn to say no and hear no. Children desperately need parents who, with love and wisdom, who will set and ensure the boundaries that have consequences. There's another law at work in this, and it's the law of reaping and sowing. Paul wrote to the church of Galatia, and he said, Don't be deceived. God will not be mocked, you, for you will reap whatever you sow. The Bible says that life is this way. Actions have consequences. There's a connection between the action you sow and the consequences that get reaped. And you've got to get clear. If you're a heavy smoker, guess what? It's going to affect your lungs. It's going to affect your health. Spending heavily, you never balance your checkbook, you never save, 
guess what? It's going to have consequences. It's going to catch up with you some or other time. If you live life evading, manipulating, and deceiving, you'll have consequences for your relationship and for your soul. The law of reaping and sowing is important for children to learn. From the moment, think about kids, old enough to care for their own laundry, and they leave dirty clothes lying around. You know what they're doing? They're waiting for the dirty clothes fairy to come and take care of it. Parents often nag their kids to pick up things, take care of themselves. They have a resentment burning, but they have this resentment burning inside of them when there are natural consequences of reaping and sowing, or sowing and reaping. If they don't wash their clothes, they must wear dirty clothes. End of story. Soon they will realize, well, I've got to do something about this because otherwise I'm just going to put on the day before's clothes. Families get in trouble and human development is trouble when parents take uh, inappropriate responsibility for their kids' problems. Let me give an example. If a child were to say these words to you, I'm bored. Often what the parents will do is start suggesting idea after dear idea. Well, here's something you can do. What if you were to do this? You could go ride your bike. It's a beautiful day. Look at the day out there. You know, Johnny down the road, maybe he's bored as well, and why don't you go and play with him? But you see, a child's boredom, especially in this day and age, is not the parent's problem. When a child comes to a parent and says, I'm bored, the appropriate response should be, that's a serious problem. I understand. You've sized up the situation perfectly. You're bored, and I've seen bored people, and you must be one of them. You're a bright kid, and I believe you'll find a good solution to this problem, and then turn around and walk away. I'm going to tell you something. If you don't do that, what you're teaching the child is that when they f what they're feeling is someone else's problem. I will reap love if I sow love. Joy, patience, diligence, and responsibility. If I sow hatred and hostility, passivity, and irresponsibility, I'll reap death. I know someone who has a brother who's a grown-up child in his 40s. He lives in the basement, plays games all day, and does nothing else. He's been on the, that path of irresponsibility year after year, which included drugs and irresponsible relationships. And his mother is under the misguided notion of helping. She bails him out whenever his life gets to a certain level of pain. Under misguided notion of helping, she thought his ability to learn that you reap what you sow. Children desperately need to learn that there are boundaries. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. Many years ago, our younger son David had this little Honda that he souped up and whatever. And we're in bed already, and uh, I get a call, and it's the Renton police. <laughs> because we live in Renton. It's the Renton police. And he says to me, you know, in my haze, he says to me, We've just caught your son speeding through the S-curves in Renton. I said, oh? And he says, yes, he has a radar with him as well, and that's illegal. I said, oh? And he says, I'm not going to give him a fine this time, but you need to talk to him. So I said, okay. So I put on the phone. Gabby asked me, what did he say? And I told her, and she said, you should have told him to lock him up for the night so that he would learn. I couldn't do that. So he walks in about 10 minutes later, quite sheepishly, and I said, David, what happened? And he tells me the whole story. And this is what I said, and I know I was wrong when I said this. I said, tell me where you bought the radar. I want to get one as well. <laughs> well, children need to learn that they're boundaries. Now, at work, boundaries are important as well. There are many people here who for wor whom work is threatening to take over your whole life. It's a time to say yes 
and there's a time to say no. You see, the first piece of wisdom in this regard is simply this. When you work, devote yourself to that job. I paged through a book a while ago, and it was called The Complete Idiot's Guide to Time Management. Now, this is a number of years ago, but uh, I read it or went through it. He cites several surveys about American work habits. Many of them all find the same result, that the average American spends 40% of their time doing something other than work while they're at work. Now, you can imagine... Social media has taken over everything now. In an eight-hour workday, this adds up to three hours. This adds up to 800 hours a year when someone's not working, but you're being paid for it. So Paul says, work. When you work, work unto the Lord as if God were your supervisor, as if your work were a gift to Him. When you finish the day, maybe you could say, Lord, this day I've given to you. And so, but some of you have no problem when it comes to work. Maybe work is just flooding, though, over the boundaries into the rest of your life. Some people are so obsessed with work that it dominates their whole life. They lack the energy, freedom, space, or ability to be the kind of spouse or parent or friend they know God wants them to be. And so we've got to set boundaries with work. God himself worked says in the story of creation that he worked for six days. And what did he do the seventh? He rested. Now understand there are times when you maybe have to take work home because it's just a deadline that you have, to, but you've got to learn to say no when it's appropriate. There's a whole debate going on right now. What do we do after work hours when we get this email from our boss? or he texts us, or he calls us and says, this needs to be done. You need to think through that for yourself and say, is this crossing a boundary? And you know, sometimes it happens once, it happens twice, and before long it's like they're pulling this rope, and you're on the end of it, and you have no time for yourself. So work is extremely important for you to set your boundaries. The last one might be called spiritual boundaries. Saying yes to God means saying no to anything that gets in the way of following it. No to temptation. No to peer pressure. Classic example is the Ten Commandments. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai, he was there for 40 days. His brother Aaron was a high priest who was the spiritual leader of the children of Israel. The Bible says when the, Moses, when the people saw Moses was delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who will go before us. As for Moses, who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. In other words, we bored, we don't know what to do, and so you, Aaron, you've got to solve this problem for us. But God had clear boundaries. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall bow down before no graven image. The people said, no, we don't want him to be our God anymore. We want some gods that we can control. We don't want to trust the God of all. And so what happens with many of us, we get impatient with God and we take over God's role in our lives. Aaron needed to say to the people, no, you must be crazy. I'm the spiritual head. There's only one God and I'm going to worship him alone. I will not disobey him. But... That's not what he did. Some of you are at places where you've been tempted to walk a different path for whatever reason. Maybe it's to be involved in deception, or maybe it's sexual behavior that you know would not be honoring and pleasing to God. Maybe it's some kind of financial misbehavior or ethical misconduct. And so what you need to do is come to the place where you say, it doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what people think. I'm going to follow my God. You know, I'll tell you, friends, that if you follow God, there's going to be times when you're tested. You must decide ahead of time what you're going to say. But what Aaron did is he called the people together and he said, take all your gold, your gold rings that are on the ears of your wife, your sons, your daughters, bring them to me. And he took the gold from them, formed it into a mold, and cast an image 
of a calf. And then he said to them, This, O Israel, is your God. Aaron was a completely compliant man. Now you can imagine what happens when Moses comes off Mount Sinai. He sees this idolatry and he says this, What did these people do to you that you brought so great sin upon them? Did they torture you? Did they threaten to kill you? Did they threaten to kill me? What in the world induced you to do this thing? Now, he has another boundary challenge. Aaron could have taken responsibility. He could have said, man, Moses, there was so much pressure. I blew it. Please forgive me. And this is what he said, though. Do not let the anger of my Lord burn hot. Moses, you're mad at me. But you know the people. They were bent on evil, so he's pointing fingers everywhere. They said, make us gods that shall go before us. So I told them, whoever has gold, take him off. And they gave it to me, and I threw it in the furnace, and out popped the calf. That's the classic response of a compliant person. Instead of saying no, he crossed a boundary. And so, the same, one other story, and we'll close with this. If you think of the beginning story, God said to Adam and Eve, he said to Adam, you can eat of any tree of the garden except that one tree. And the evil one tempts Eve and says, God didn't mean you can't do that. He knows that if you do, your eyes will be opened and you'll know the difference between good and evil and you'll be like God. So eat the fruit. Eve says, okay. And then he takes it, she takes it to Adam and says, eat the fruit, it's good. Then God comes to Adam and says this, Adam, why did you do such a thing? Why did you disobey me and eat the fruit? Now, does Adam take responsibility? Of course not. In fact, what he says, it was the woman you gave me. <laughs> it was the woman you gave me. She wasn't my idea. Let's see who thought this one up, God. You or me? God says, Eve, why did you do this thing? Well, she points again. The serpent deceived me. Friends, some of you have said no and you've crossed a boundary. Your healing cannot start until you say, I did it, until you take responsibility, fall on your knees and ask God for forgiveness. And God is so gracious to forgive anyone who will ask, but you have to ask. Jesus exemplifies this because he needed to be with the Father. On a number of occasions, you read in the Gospels how he withdrew and went on a mountain to be on his own with the Father. It says, in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up and went to a deserted place where he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. They looked for him everywhere. And when they found him, they said this, Everyone is searching for you, Jesus. Why didn't you take your cell phone with you? I just threw that in. <laughs> they wanted him to be accessible 24 hours a day. And Jesus said, I'm not going to live that way. Jesus said no to non-stop accessibility. Not because he didn't care about his friends, but because he knew that sometimes he would have to say no to the people to spend time with his father. Jesus was ready to say no to the whole world, no to pressure, temptation, false demands, so that he could say yes to his father. Imagine your life wholeheartedly living an unconditional yes to God. It would mean saying no to a lot of things and saying yes to some other things. It would require great wisdom and discernment with friends and family and work and your spiritual life. Can you imagine standing before God one day, give an account of your life, and you kind of review it with Him? Imagine if you said yes. Yes to the gifts that God has given you. Yes to the calling on your life. Yes to a life of serving. And yes to 
you freely offered love. Imagine saying no. No when you ought to say no. No to sin. No to guilt. No to appeasing. No to fear. No to exhaustion. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. So, in the end, what are you going to say? I've given you a whole lot of words this morning, but what are you going to say? Think about those four areas that we've spoken about in your family, in your work, your spiritual life, your friends. Think about those areas one by one for a moment, just as we wrap the service up. And think about what you said yes to and you shouldn't have, what you said no to and you shouldn't have. And ask the Lord to help you make the right decision for Him. Because you know, that's where the blessing resides. And of course you're going to get tested, especially now. Now that we've spoken about it, you're going to get tested. But you know what? Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. And begin to sow good, good seed. Sow good seed into good soil, and you'll see the blessings will return to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Father, I thank you. For today I thank you for these precious people who they are who you've created them to be father I know that so many of us are falling short of your perfect will for our lives because Lord we haven't respected the boundaries that you've set for us we know you've said in your word that your word is a lamp unto our feet. Let it be so, Lord. Let us not get caught up in all the, the discussions and the talk and all that stuff out there. But let us rather focus in on you and be willing to say yes when we need to say yes and no when we need to say no. I ask that in Jesus' name. Give us the courage to do that, Father. Give us the willingness to do that. Give us the understanding of how to do that, Father, in Jesus' name. So that we might know your blessings as we go forward in this life in Jesus' name. Now next week, I'm going to be talking about getting serious about recreation. And guess what? I'm talking to myself. I'll be talking to myself. Because I don't know what recreation is, really. I don't have a hobby. I don't have any of that. So, maybe Pastor Dimitri will pray for me, eh? Good. <laughs> Let's stand and worship quickly.